forward, they're going to trouble anybody. Yeah, they are. There's, there's no question about it. But I think if you look at you look at Mourinho and Brendan Rodgers, I think although Liverpool, for me, Liverpool were the, were the better team on the night. There's no question of it. And therefore, I think Brendan Rodgers will be the more frustrated. I think Mourinho, Mourinho will be sat in the dressing room saying to their lads, that was the game plan, that's what we wanted. We wanted to, to bring them out, which we did. Then we got the goal and the counter-attack against the run of play. And then we defended quite well for, for quite, a, quite a large amount of the game. And yes, they did score. So Brendan Rodgers, although for me Liverpool were the better team, Mourinho will be the happier yeah. of the two managers because Brendan Rodgers will have been thinking to himself, we needed to get another goal, we really did. Because what you'll find when Chelsea, when it goes back to Chelsea next week, oh, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be role reversal. You know, Fabregas will probably go back and sit with Matic, then uh, Oscar will probably come in, and it'll be Liverpool sitting back, and then looking to get on the counter-attack. But, if I'm looking at Liverpool's front four, and I'm looking at Chelsea's front four at the moment, who do I think that Liverpool can do that against Chelsea? Personally, no, I don't. I think Chelsea are right to do that because they are good at the back. And Chelsea might, will he change it a bit? Will he bring Oscar back, do you think, into his midfield? Yes. I think he will do. I think what he'll do, I think he'll look to go to go back and think, right, okay, I'll have Matic sitting with Fabregas, you know, usual back four, and then possibly Oscar, um, Oscar Hazard and Willian maybe behind um, behind Diego Costa. And I think that's what he looks to do away from because the emphasis will be on them. And if Liverpool want to go there and play in the counter attack, I think it's going to be very, very difficult because we've seen what Chelsea are capable of. They didn't play great tonight, but you just know every time they go forward, the players they've got on the pitch, they are going to produce something and they are going to create chances. Let's look ahead, if we may, now to tomorrow night's game on Talk Sport. It's Spurs as well. Real chances as far as they're concerned of reaching a Capital One Cup final at Wembley against either Liverpool or Chelsea, but Sheffield United's performances in Cups has been outstanding over the past couple of seasons. Another memorable, memorable night in the Capital One Cup. Capital One, it's not important the level the, if you play in the Premier League or in League One. And, and we need to show respect for, for Sheffield United. The players are up for it, they relish it. It is much easier to play when you're playing in front of, you know, atmospheres and, and full houses and everything. It sort of takes care of itself, you know. I think that uh, we need to, to be focused on our game. It's a very important, it's a semi-final. And we understand that it's, it's an important game. Oh, 
I, I, sometimes, certainly I do it, uh, and have said that from my experience, which is why I am a supporter of renegotiating our relationship with the European Union and having a referendum on that. So that then that people some people may think, you know, reform and so on, may think these politicians are pretending they're in charge of things, and aren't we in charge of very much? Well, it, yes, I can understand what people mean, and it is true, of course, that power is now held at many, many more levels. Ownership of the EU project will pass to the electorate, albeit briefly, if there's a referendum on EU membership. If Britain votes to stay in, Mr Farage will face a stark choice between accepting the democratically elected will of the people and sticking to his demand for what he calls British independence. So, what will he do? Would it be right, though, for you to say like that? You know, they've been voting to stay in Europe, they've been voting to leave the house. But why not the party? Well, won't argue again. Would you be like Alex Salmon just say, we'll give it another go? Well, I don't think that... I don't think any of these people ever would have given up the last government themselves. So, uh, I don't think... I think that the loss of the referendum, you know, it means curtains for Nigel, and it means curtains for Carl Crowell here in the head office. But do these ideas die and go away? No, I don't. For now, though, Farage and UKIP are very much here to stay, as are the other insurgent forces. Natalie Bennett's Greens, Nicola Sturgeon's SNP, powered by a craving for more choice. These populist Davids are giving the establishment Goliaths a bloody nose. Professor Matt Flinders says he hates populism, but he's excited by what we're seeing. The great positive element of contemporary politics, because we need to push away this politics of pessimism, is that the fracturing of the party system is almost like a volcano. There is a great bottom-up democratic energy which is desperate. It has a real appetite for voice and engagement in democratic politics. That fracturing of politics suggests a future of permanent parliamentary deal-making, if not necessarily continued coalitions. So how does William Hague, who's retiring as an MP at this election, regard the new politics? Of course, it's semi conservative party, so all the established parties are all the same. And indeed, it's the main reason why people would vote for the um, I suppose we're trying to show they're all the same. Uh, that is the one thing that they're trying to appeal on, rather than an actual positive effect on politics. And would there, would any of them be actually in the difference with government or in the constitution? Well, no, they wouldn't. Both of the Tories and Labour will spend the next few months trying to convince you that the country does face that big choice and that voting for anyone but them is to risk the wrong outcome. <coughs> Professor Flinders thinks, though, that it is only the first part of the post voting system which is saving them from even more dramatic change. The challenge we have is that our democratic system from the fall of the 18th and 19th century that simply can't cope. And what you can see now is a fracturing and a bursting through of democratic energy, which is, to some extent, tearing apart the party system. Our electoral system is trying to hold it back. But the idea of a two or a two and a half party system has gone, never to be returned. Next week, in the final part of the Can Democracy Work, I'll be examining how that 18th century system might change in order to give people the choice and the voice which they so clearly demand. Can Democracy Work was presented by Nick Robinson and produced by Jonathan Brunet. This morning, Professor Michael Sandel presented a special Democracy Day edition of The Public Philosopher, recorded in the Palace of Westminster. You can hear an extended version of the debate now on the Radio 4 website. Meanwhile, over on Radio 3, Free Thinking is discussing whether depictions of politicians and governments on stage, film and TV make us cynical about parliamentary democracy, or that they help our understanding. Free Thinking is about to talk about the other on Radio 3. Well, may the form join Richard the Shah for The World Tonight. Let's take a look at the weather forecast. It can be a bright day across the northern parts after a cold start tomorrow, but wintry showers will affect the northwest. It's cloudy skies elsewhere, with occasional rain, sleet and snow slowly dying out through the day. It will remain cold, especially across central parts of the country. After a frosty, foggy start, Thursday will be largely dry, with cold spells, but still very cold. However, the rain and snow will spread to northwestern parts later. This is BBC Radio 4. Agency 
see if he jumps back to the margin. The Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq war won't report until after the election. Greece prepares to go to the polls at the weekend. Things were really bad two years ago. We are now on the bottom. We don't have anything else than to go up. We hear why some Greeks believe the economy is finally recovering. And we're all set up I mean, it works. Thanks to cells. A former page three model tells us why she thinks it was so popular. It's now out of date. But first, BBC News is read by Jane Steele. A British man will be fleeing to his own death fighting in Syria so he could secretly return to the UK and admitted to Tony's offences. Imran Khawaja, who's 27 and from London, pleaded guilty to attending a training camp for those preparing acts of terrorism. While in Syria, he posted graphic images online in support of Islamic State militants. Our Home Affairs correspondent Dominic Kachiani reports. Imran Khawaja's prosecution is the gravest Syria case to come before the court so far. Training camp last January and helped other British fighters publish a slick online propaganda to attract recruits. Which posted online the British man wearing a mask can be seen holding a severed head. Last June he decided to come home. It's not clear why. He posted an online obituary saying he'd been martyred in battle. Trying to slip back into the country at Dover, the police were waiting. Marsha was initially charged with soliciting to murder. The first prisoner to face such an allegation in the to Syria. Can now lie on file. He returns to court for sentencing and could still be jailed for a while. Japan has insisted it will not give in to terrorism after Islamic State threatened to kill two Japanese hostages unless it received a ransom of $200 million. The figure is the same amount which Tokyo has pledged in aid to Middle Eastern countries fighting IS. Japan says the aid was non military and was to pay for healthcare and food. France has pursued citizenship on a man from Mali who saved customers to Jewish supermarkets from Islamist gunmen. His investigations continue into that attack with the murder of 12 people to satirical magazine. James Reynolds in Paris watched the citizenship ceremony. Welcome to France, the country's Prime Minister Manuel Valls has told La Salle about TV. The audience at the Interior Ministry cheered. The 24-year-old supermarket worker dark suits and blue shirts, smiles and accepted his citizenship papers. During the speeches made in his honour, he clasped his hands in front of him, stared at the grounds, apparent shyness. He stressed he was not a hero. Here in Paris, the authorities continue to investigate the shootings at the supermarkets and also the offices of the Shelley and Doe newspaper. Prosecutors plan to ask a judge to charge the four men detained last week with conspiracy to commit terrorist acts. The long-awaited Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq war will not be published until after the general election in May. The inquiry began its report in 2009, but the last evidence was heard in 2011. The inquiry chairman, Sir John Chilcot, will set out his reasons for deserving to leave in an exchange of letters with the Prime Minister tomorrow. Here's our political correspondent, Ross Hawkins. Four years have passed since the Chilcot inquiry led its final round of evidence. Ministers have previously said the report could not be published unless Sir John Chilcot delivered it to the government by the end of February. It is understood that the process of giving witnesses time to respond to allegations made against them has not been completed. Previously, officials have blamed the time taken to process tens of thousands of requests to declassify complicated and sensitive documents. There's likely to be a furious reaction from politicians who have been frustrated by the delays. On Sunday, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said the fact the report had not yet been made public was a scandal. Fierce fighting is continuing in eastern Ukraine between government forces and pro-Russian separatists. The Ukrainian army says its troops have also come under heavy fire from Russian forces. The Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe has called for an immediate ceasefire. Bethany Bell reports from Vienna. The Ukrainian government says its forces have been attacked by regular Russian army units in the Luhansk region of eastern Ukraine. The reports haven't been independently confirmed, but if true, could represent a significant turn of the course. Meanwhile, diplomatic efforts to try and calm the situation are intensifying. In a rare show of unity, all of the countries and the European security body, the OSCE, which includes both Russia and Ukraine, called for an immediate ceasefire. To 
tomorrow the Ukrainian and Russian foreign ministers are expected to hold talks in Berlin with their counterparts from France and Germany. President Obama will call for higher taxes on the rich and he makes his State of the Union address in a few hours' time. With the Republicans in control of both houses of Congress, they'll be unable to put any ideas they don't agree with into practice. The unions and the health sector will never attempt now to negotiate an end to their dispute over NHS pay in England and Northern Ireland. The unions are set to stage another 12-hour walk-up on Thursday next week. The jury has heard claims there was a murderer at work on two wards of an NHS hospital in Greater Manchester. Victorino Chua, a male nurse, is accused of murdering three patients and poisoning 18 others at the Second Hill Hospital near Stockport in 2011. Our correspondent Judith Moritz is at Manchester Crown Court. Victorino Cure is said to have turned from the man who dedicated his life caring for others to harming them. He was a nurse at Stepping Hill Hospital near Stockport, and it's alleged that in summer 2011 he turned poisoner, tampering with bags of saline and contaminating ampules, adding insulin to them with catastrophic results. Three people died, another was left with brain damage, and 17 patients were poisoned but later recovered. The jury was told that Victorino Chua tampered with the solutions and left them for other unwitting staff to use. Victorino Chua faces 36 charges, including three of murder. He denies them all. The first witness has been giving evidence in the trial of Gary Pisa on the charges of historical sex abuse. The woman, whose identity is protected, described how the rock star attempted to rape her after a house party in 1975 when she was eight. Gary Glitter, whose real name is Paul Grant, denies 10 charges of indecent and sexual assault on girls under the age of 16. The Indonesian government has confirmed that the Air Asia plane that crashed last month with 162 people on board climbed at an abnormally high speed in its final minutes. Transport Minister said radar data showed that the aircraft had ascended suddenly at a speed of 6,000 feet a minute, then stalled and disappeared. Thank you, Jane. You're listening to The World Tonight with Nicola Shah. A boy set Bashish Javadi in Iran Khawaja who spent six months in Syria last year and faked his death in an attempt to return to the UK. The 27-year-old from West London has admitted preparing for acts of terrorism, attending a camp, receiving training and possessing firearms. Legal restrictions were lifted today to allow the reporting of his guilty pleas. Kawaja joined a group called Wayat al tawahid which is affiliated to IS. He was part of its online propaganda campaign to recruit other young British Muslims. During the trial at the Old Bailey, the court was shown a photograph of Kawaja in combat gear and a balaclava, sitting on a tank with a rifle, and another that showed him at a training camp carrying an assault rifle. Kawaja also posed with a severed head before trying to re-enter the UK. Dr Shiraz Nair is from King's College Centre for the Study of Radicalisation and Political Violence. There was one picture which is very disturbing to him. Uh, he's holding a band that had uh, at least 15 severed heads uh, inside it of Syrian army uh, soldiers. Uh, we saw videos uh, from Ray of that involved people uh, involved in war crimes, for example, at school prisons and all that kind of thing. It's not clear why Kawaja decided to return to the UK, but he used a social media account to announce his death during fighting. His cousin, Sahir Fati from Watford, helped him to return by driving him back from Bulgaria in June 2014. The pair were arrested by police officers waiting for them at Dover. When Imran Kawaja returns to court for sentencing, he could be jailed for life. Commander Richard Walton is the head of the Metropolitan Police's Counter-Terrorism Command. He stressed the seriousness of Imran Kawaja's actions. Imran Kawaja was, um, was not a vulnerable teenager that was travelled out to Syria, being enticed to travel out to Syria. This is a man who has chosen the path of terrorism. He's chosen to go out to Syria to be trained to engage in a terrorist training camp. Uh, we don't know why he came back, uh, we don't know what he was planning, um, but this is a dangerous man that's a trained uh, terrorist. One feature of the Kawaja case was the use of a communications app called Telegram, a secured and encrypted system that couldn't be intercepted. It's this kind of technology David Cameron may have had in mind when, after the Paris attacks, he said there should be no means of communication which we cannot read. The Prime Minister was making a case for new legislation to enable the security agencies to monitor and retain communications data in the face of a rising terror threat.
day that Corey is echoed by a strong sword. He stood down at head of MI6 in November last year. There needs to be some new compact between the technology companies and those who are responsible for security. If we're not to see events like uh, we saw in Paris last week and which we've seen um, uh, also across in Yemen, in Nigeria and so on, become more and more features of our lives. We can't afford that to happen. He went on to warn of the real danger facing the country. If I was to sit here and say, will um, the, uh, uh, the goalkeepers of uh, the security services and the police keep every single uh, attempt to uh, get the ball into the net out? No. At some point, these threats will get through and there will be another terrorist attack in this country. Last week, the Prime Minister set out what he would like to do with you in the election in May. The first duty of any government is to keep our country and our people safe. The attacks in Paris once again demonstrated the scale of the terrorist threat that we face and the need to have robust powers through our intelligence and security agencies and policing in order to keep our people safe. And the powers that I believe we need, whether on communications data or on the content of communications, I, I'm very comfortable that those are absolutely right for a modern liberal democracy. So is collecting more data critical in the battle against violent extremists? Mark Field is the Conservative MP for the cities of London and Westminster and a member of the Joint Intelligence and Security Committee. James Blessing is chairman of ISPA, the Internet Services Providers Association. Is there a need for new legislation of the sort David Cameron advocates? James Blessing first. The legislation already exists to go after known targets. The problem we seem to be trying to address is trying to capture everything just in case we miss something, which is a very difficult position to put in because it means you capture lots of other things that you don't need to be capturing uh, at all. And you're also looking at potentially weakening the strength of the internet economy by trying to add additional functionality that gives security services access to things that they would like to have access to, but it also gives uh, an opportunity to hackers and people who want to go after your confidential information a way to go and get that confidential information while it's in transit. And that, that's a really bad place to go. So Mark Gill, we run the danger actually of, of weakening security as far as hackers and people are concerned. And the criticism that I think has been made by Nick Flegg as well, why should we try and capture all kinds of things that we know are, are not necessary of the, the data belonging to innocent people? Well, I think there's a common misconception that uh, somehow our security services have free reign to undertake surveillance at will. And the truth really is that uh, our secret services are obliged to act within a very strict framework of law. And above all, they have to ensure that everything is very necessary in all proportions. And to address the issue directly about the other side, the other top call, getting hold of the needle out of the haystack, there is a distinction between data and content. In other words, a distinction between being aware of the when and where might have been uh, online or, or made a turn conversation and the absolute content. But it is the sort of new legislation that the Prime Minister's been talking about and John Soares has been talking about today, the proposals, would they allow more access to more content? I think in part we have a very complicated legal framework at the moment. My own view is we clearly need a consolidation of the legislation to ensure that there's no opportunity for the security services to arbitrage or to make it easier to have students under one piece of legislation rather than another. James Blessing, to have clarity in the legislation and says to update it to reflect the, the technology that's being used now, why is that a bad thing? I have no objection to a wholesale review of legislation as it stands because it probably is out of date. It's 10, 15 years old in the places and older in other places, but the default position of making it allow people to do more seems to be potentially the wrong way of looking at it. Data is already available on communications. We already store a lot of that data in a format that is readily accessible and under ripple. Those requests can be made and as a service provider, we daily get requests for pieces of information and we provide it as quickly as we humanly can. And RIPA is the Regulatory and Investigatory Powers Act. Mark Field, what would be wrong with that approach? There's already a lot of cooperation between the internet service providers and the security services across the world. And in many ways, the Snowden revelations in the Guardian of 18 months ago probably gave rise to concerns that perhaps there's an overly cosy relationship. The interesting thing here is that 
probably in this country, um, partly because of the, the culture of uh, what happened at Bletchley Park during the war, because of the glamorous culture of James Bond, we are a bit more relaxed, I think, in the UK about the idea of having secret intelligence services, and we recognise that sort of quite a lot of their work has to remain secret. Of course, there's a very different culture in the United States, where the power of the individual against the all-embracing power of the state is something that is very uh, carefully guarded. Here in this country, I think we are a bit more relaxed about all of this and the idea that, of course, our security services are going to cooperate with uh, communication service uh, providers. James Bursing, that is the balancing act, isn't it? Preserving yeah. privacy and encryption and so on, but also ensuring the safety of the public is the business. I can understand that desire to try and get into the, the dark spaces of the internet. But the problem that I have, and, and we have as an industry, is that a lot of our day-to-day -day operations depend on that security, that ability of people to know that communication between point A and point B is secure and there is nobody listening to it. It, it sort of completely derails the concept of online banking if you cannot trust the site at the other end is the site you think you're talking to and that your details of the bank account you've just made are secure. You've also got your tax return. You've got all those things that you do on a daily basis that people don't necessarily today think of as being secure. But as a communication service provider, we have to make sure that those transactions are completely safe, that nobody is able to get in there and nobody is able to intercept that information and use it for their own benefit. When it comes to businesses, the number of organisations who are trying to encourage their staff to work from home on an occasional basis, they wouldn't be able to do anything. They wouldn't be able to communicate securely because they couldn't believe that the information that their, their staff were accessing wasn't being leaked to a third party. James Blessing and Mark Field. Greeks go to the polls next Sunday and the radical left-wing party, Syriza, looks set to win the most votes in the former government. Its promise to end austerity and redistribute wealth as never before. It's all deeply frustrating to those Greeks who believe that austerity measures are finally working. The current country's economy is growing for the first time in years and unemployment is falling, albeit marginally. One place that's seen the fruits of growth is Greece's second city, Thessaloniki, from where the world tonight's poor monster reports now. It's the sound of heavy-duty vehicle parts rolling off the production line. And if you believe the people who work here, this is also the sound of Greece itself getting into gear. Because at the Namco car plant just outside Thessaloniki, they decided to triple production this year. And the company's irrepressible manager, Petros Kondogouris, insists it's a sign that the Greek economy is finally on the move again. Things were really bad two years ago, and things are much better now. We have started the reforms, which are very important for Greece, and we think this year will be a very nice year. There is an election coming in Greece. What are you hoping will happen? We would like very much to continue the reforms which are necessary for Greece, because we are now on the bottom. We, we don't have anything else that to go up. I heard that same message, more of the same things. I visited one of the Thessaloniki's more posh hotels. Tourism is growing in this region right now. And the president of the local hoteliers association is another who believes that the Greek economy is turning a corner with the current government, led by the Conservative New Democracy Party. That government has cut public spending, raised taxes, and most controversially, it laid off several hundred thousand people working in the country's public sector. Aristoteles Thermopolis acknowledges these austerity measures have been painful. It is no time, he says, for a new turn. This is the big risk for our country, that we will have steps to move us back the door to years, nobody productively thinking in this country. We don't deserve to be a country with the habits that we get in the past. This is the big danger of this Sunday election. Thank you. 
called Sierra because we think it's the only way to get away from uh, this different situation of the austerity. Austerity is never necessary, neither for Greeks, neither not for uh, any other uh, country as well. Sirius is making a lot of promises for all the things he will do if he gets into power. We do believe the promises. There's no other way. Why do you support Syriza? Because it's the only hope at this time. The only hope. The only hope. Syriza make a lot of promises. All these things they're going to do. Can they afford it, do you think? Of course. Yes. Yes. I think so. I'm sure. The star turn of the evening for Syriza's charismatic leader, Alexander Tsipras. Tsipras is currently the public enemy number one for officials of the European Commission. Because it was the Commission, the IMF, which demanded austerity measures from Greece in the first place in return for bailout loans. Tsipras said that if Syriza comes to power, the European Commission could whistle for its money. They'll refuse to pay all of it and demand a renegotiation. One of the party's local candidates at Thessaloniki, Kostas Ambojus, insisted to me this was a matter of justice, but also necessity. We cannot pay all the debt. We say yes, Syriza. But we need to cut the amount of debt that there is less than 50%. You refuse need to pay half the debt that you owe. We say that the debt is not sustainable. This can't go on. This can't go on. We need to grow. We need to change. We cannot wait for solutions from the old parties, from the corrupt parties. We want to end the corruption and tax evasion from the old parties. Only Syriza can assure that. The irony is that many of the radical changes Syriza wants already happened here in Thessaloniki, but at a local level. Here in the city hall, a new mayor came to power five years ago, a technocrat, not political party aligned. The first thing he did was to hand over the financial books to external auditors. It turned out that tens of millions of euros had gone missing. And eventually, the previous mayor was sent to prison for embezzlement. Since then, the new kids on the block here have tried to crack down on local tax evasion. Now they've got rid of some of the more absurd inefficiencies in council spending. So I asked the deputy mayor here, how's that going on? The same 